Thank you very much. Oh, is that working? Thank you very much for having me. Um, so I'm going to start by telling you, well, actually, um, Jelani's just said everything that I was going to say uh, effectively. So my name's Caroline. I'm a director of Franklin Till Studio. We're a futures research studio um, based in London. Effectively, what we're looking at is how emerging design innovation can impact positive change, both e ecological and social. Um, we're just amassing research continually and outputting it and curating it mainly into publications, exhibitions and events. I suppose what we're really passionate about is trying to take the very complex and present it in ways which uh, people can understand, can resonate with and see how it can become meaningful, both for, I suppose, for companies, businesses and brands, but for the wider population. Um, very quickly, some of the, the work that we produce includes mainly our output is magazines we produce um, two magazines uh, two biannual publications viewpoint um, this is the, the current issue of which is called think small um, which is so beautifully pertinent with um, many of the conversations that were I was listening to yesterday um, which is the current issue we're really looking at this the notion of the small revolution which I'm going to talk a bit a, a bit more about today and how um, the sort of rise of technology is giving rise to distributed manufacture um, and really thinking about a more open source future we also produce um, exhibitions on a global scale. This is a major project we work with um, in America with VF Corporation, a, a large fashion conglomerate, looking at the future of fashion effectively. And what was so exciting about this project was we had the opportunity to pair um, 80 leading uh, material scientists with 80 leading designers to come up with new prototypes, all aiming to respond to emerging needs. So not just to sort of make technology for the sake of technology, but actually look at how it could be incorporated in, into prototypes to actually respond to challenges. Um, and then looking at things like biomaterial futures and the, the emergence of a, a, a grown future, which um, Maurizio so beautifully covered yesterday. This was an exhibition recently in Germany. And sort of smaller scale events uh, that we produced. This was in London, uh, a series, an ongoing series called Secret Sensory Suppers, looking at the sort of conversion of, of um, sensorial experiences and, and the dining landscape and how that can uh, give rise to sort of new immersive experiences. So that's just a tiny, because people, particularly my mum always says, what do you do? And um, I find it really difficult to explain, if I'm honest, so it's often easier to show um, rather than tell. Today, I was asked to talk about just a small subject, the future of, of making and materials. And I have to be totally honest that last night, I completely um, remade my slides because I feel like the speakers yesterday answered that question. Um, and what, what was so interesting yesterday is um, that there seemed to be convergence on so many points and, and um, really there were several key themes that came through. So I, f I felt like rather than just saying the same things and you getting a bit bored of it, I'm, I might first of all take the role of, of perhaps summarising some of the ideas um, and then moving forward to hopefully showing some exciting case study examples of probably some of some of your work and, and other makers that are, are really responding to these changes in the future of, of making. So um, I think what I wanted to say was, what, as I was sitting there yesterday, I was thinking there has never been a better or more exciting time to be a maker. And that may sound crazy because the world is probably crazier than it has ever been. But it seems that there are there is this sort of convergence of societal trends along with the emergence of, of technology that is really empowering and enabling makers in a way that has never happened before. As I go through, I think we do need to discuss that there are some challenges. It's not it's not straightforward. Um, the first point that I think many people made yesterday is is the environment is challenging us. But I think as as makers, we are best placed to be responding to that. And one such example that I love is um, the Ship Museum, which um, probably many of you have come across. And I think what's encompassed in, in, in this project is inefficiency in saying, 
a point that came up yesterday was the notion that actually resources are going to potentially become the source of future conflict. We know that there's a growing population. We know the environment is challenging us more than ever before. So we need to rethink resources. Um, and I think we talked a lot about the rise of a, a manufacturing revolution yesterday, a production revolution. But I think what we're also seeing is the rise of a materials revolution in line with that. And the two have to work hand in hand. So what's nice about this project is that it encompasses efficiency. So it's based on a, a, a dairy farm in Italy. Um, so they produce milk um, and... Um, they basically extract the methane gas from the manure, from the byproduct of the, of, of the milk production process. Um, and they effectively make this, uh, what they call merda cotta, a sort of shit clay, basically, that they can then make into products. Um, so we interviewed one of the founders of, of, the, of the Ship Museum. He says, the main idea that drives a revolution is transformation. We're using one of the poorest materials on the earth and not only using it, but more importantly, transforming it in numerous creative ways. We're giving it a second life to a subject that is perceived as a low value. So I suppose that's one of the points that I wanted to make, that we're responding in amazing ways to this, this environmental challenge. And it doesn't have to always be high tech, but it can be about reconsidering what we have. And, and I'm going to talk a bit more about that later and I just wanted to touch on some of the, the things that the speaker said and I think Maurizio encompassed so beautifully that notion of the maker at the, the forefront of driving this materials revolution um, because you know growing and, and the, the, the biological fabrication is is also a, a new technology that in the future is going to be more at our fingertips again I'm, I'm going to talk more about that later actually there's one other point that I wanted to pull out that Maurizio said yesterday that I thought was so profound um, was that he said that he designs or makes to get rid of stuff I love that idea that actually we redefine the maker because we've got too much and and perhaps our satisfaction can come out of almost undoing what what we already have and and actually getting you know materials back into different states um, I thought that was really amazing so another opportunity that we have as as makers is technology is massively advancing 50 years ago printing involved huge scale printing presses the poignancy wasn't lost on me as that the only sort of Instagram picture I've taken so far is that amazing beautiful bit of machinery just outside I don't even know what it is but there's something so poetic about this sort of large bulky wheel that speaks of sort of manufacturing of yesterday it, so yeah what I'm trying to say is the printing press used to be the way that we you know that we distributed information that we printed but now most of us have a desktop printer in our home or many of us might have gone beyond that and not even have one anymore and I think you know we are potentially on the brink, as, as has been discussed, of this digital fabrication revolution where the 3D printer is at the, the cost of, you know, I think the cheapest one around is around $50 now. You can have a 3D printer in your own home if you know how to use it, which is a problem we'll come on to, to later. Um, so, you know, is, is, um, is the 3D printer going to sort of supersede the factory in the same way that we've seen the desktop printer supersede the factory? So, what I'm trying to say is digital technology is already enabling a whole host of small scale uh, sort of factories effectively. Um, I think yesterday Indy Johar um, referred to this as micro massive, which I thought was a really nice term. And this is one such example. This is an, uh, a magazine distributed in Holland. It's print on demand. So this piece of machinery can print um, and bind the magazine in under three minutes and you can pick it up in, in local stores. Or um, we've actually just produced a magazine that you is optimised for home printing so and has very simple binding techniques that you can make your, yourself at home. So that's really exciting in terms of um, reaching new customers in, in new ways, um, but also meaning that waste is, is not so much of an issue. I think unmade were one of the examples that people touched upon heavily yesterday. And, you know, the fact that we can make now one item, this is this is um, this is their stole machine, their digital knitting machine, effectively, that can make one jumper, you know, and, and can be can be done affordably. And the fact that you can um, customize that on the bus if you like you can download the unmade app you can effectively connect and allow your customer um, to, to design with you on the go now um, obviously if you have access to the correct te technology and correct tools 
I think one thing I wanted to say about that is the examples. That, so this is another such example. This is um, the generative scarfs application by Convivial Projects. I think what's so successful about these two examples is that they make it easy and they make it poetic and they make it quite an ama a sort of a immersive experience. Um, we are not all digital natives. Um, I think of my mum and, um, you know, she's 71 and you know, behaves like a 20 year old but has no idea how to operate her iPhone. Um, so. I, I downloaded this app for her and she could do it. So it, it's got to be uh, engaging and immersive in a way that is also intuitive. Um, otherwise, people you know, are not going to want to get involved. So in producing the magazine, we have the pleasure of speaking to some really amazing sort of thought leaders across the world. I wanted to include a quote. I think you've got a representative of Autodesk talking later. Um, so this is Mickey McManus, who is a visiting research fellow at, at Autodesk, who's the multinational design, engineering and entertainment software corporation. He said, it used to be only big companies that could make a mould, use a computer, CNC materials and so on. Students and startups now have access to tools that, could be, that used to cost tens of thousands of dollars. The tools used to be used by people who designed Tesla and cars like Nike shoes. This is enabling not only the maker movement, but also the connected maker movement. So I think the opportunity that was really presented yesterday is that actually digital, digital communication uh, um, is empowering people. Um, technology's almost greatest benefit is the empowerment of the individual. We now seem to have more control over our lives in, in unimaginable ways. Um, and through the internet, we're connected as never before. So this is leading to a sort of social dynamic that allows individual actions and contributions across communities to come together. Um, so one such example is Etsy. So for the maker, this has meant that we're connected and we can share knowledge, as I'm going to talk a bit, a bit more about later, and we can share interests and opinions and experiences. But moreover, we can connect to buyers in a way that we've never been able to before. Um, Etsy is now the largest certified socially responsible company. It's worth it, uh, In 2015, it was worth over $3 billion. So it's a, not a small scale thing but it's just the fact that it's connecting you to a customer that you can work on a very small scale from your home is is actually very empowering um, one of the interesting questions that came up yesterday was somebody talking about um, you know all of this is very sort of targeted towards um, people living in urban environments and yet it's true okay I think figures show that by 2020 there's going to be something like crazy over 80 percent of us are going to live in cities but um, there is you know also, the internet is empowering individuals on a community basis through forging online communities. So things like Makerspace or um, Makery is, is one of the examples that we love, um, which is basically like an online resource where you're sharing information, knowledge. Um, the fact that we seem to, on an individual level, feel empowered to, to Google how to do something, like I don't know how to whether it's from the example yesterday, change my oil in my car, or you, uh, probably one of the first places people go now is actually to Google how to do it. And um, that, is, that is very empowering. And then if you can actually connect to people and feel that you're part of a community um, through such online resources as this, it, it, it really, in a way, obviously, uh, f you know, there's, there's a lot to be said for one-to-one -one sort of real world interaction but this this type of resource is enabling a sense of connection wherever you are um so just as i mentioned this this notion of real world connection i wanted to sort of uh cover one of the major topics that was coming through yesterday was the importance and the sort of emergence of of the maker space this sort of facility, this area, this space where people are getting together and, and pooling resources, knowledge. Um, I was lucky enough to be involved. We're working with IKEA at the moment who are really interested in this this, and, and really realise as a, as a huge scale manufacturer their role in, in you know, the future of manufacturing and how they can start to, to bring things back to be more local and think about the way they use resources. As part of which I was working with Space 10, their innovation arm, and we conducted an, a, a visit of the Poblenou area in Barcelona, 
which has, I think it was mentioned yesterday, it basically has the, the, the largest number of maker spaces in the smallest area, and it's almost operating as a micro fab city, the model that was mentioned yesterday, in that it is self-sufficient, it's creating its own materials, it's creating its own energy, and these maker spaces are connecting and sharing resources. Um, and it was a really inspiring visit because I didn't quite believe it when, um, you know, when I was explained to it and asked to come out and report on it. And I think what was really interesting is that it was empowering not just the people, but an area. So the Poblé New area in Barcelona was completely wiped out um, with the sort of rise of global manufacture in that it was, it was an industrial area and suddenly everything then shut down when manufacture shipped off to, to China or to India. And actually now the area has been totally regenerated because of these small scale maker spaces. So I just wanted to make the point that it's not necessarily just about individual empowerment, but it's about empowerment of, of areas and, and potential for urban regeneration. This is a really inspiring report that I feel that um, Nat Hunter, I don't know if she's still here, but yesterday was a speaker. It was probably heavily involved in this report. It's called Ours to Master, How Makerspaces Can Help Us Master Technology for a More Human End. It was a report um, by the Royal Society of Arts. And this was a quote that I loved in it. The maker movement is a reaction to significant technological upheaval and indicative of a desire among people to have control over their lives as workers, consumers and citizens. The act of making is one of regaining mastery over technology, not just because it enables us to be more self-reliant, but because it can boost our sense of agency. And um, sorry, there was one bit... Uh, it added, basically the report concluded that makerspaces are sites of av agitation that champion a different way of living. And I really, there's something really powerful about that, that these, these sort of spaces that enable this sense of individual agency, but you can, all, you can test. And, and, you can all, and as technology is changing and changing rapidly and you know, exponentially growing, you can try and understand it and get to grips with it in a space that feels sort of safe. So the opportunity of the small revolution, so this is what we've just written about in, in Viewpoint magazine, and this was a, a book that has been really uh, inspiring to us uh, by Adam Lent, Why the Era of Big Government, Big Business and Big Culture is, o is Over. So these digitally nimble sort of powerful networks are not only nimble, but they're part of this wider revolution of small against big. Essentially what this book is saying is that people are choosing to work for, you know, set up their own companies or work for small companies rather than giant corporations. Um, and, he, and Adam Lent, the author, is saying that change is increasingly delivered by small initiatives rather than large-scale government. People are feeling disillusioned by sort of uh, large organisations like government. They feel like they're not being represented, particularly as we might have seen over the last couple of days. So uh, there's more people have this sense of sort of wanting to take back autonomy over their own lives. And I suppose I wanted to say that that feels like a massive opportunity for, for the maker because people seem more predisposed to, to sort of smaller scale production, smaller scale uh, provenance than ever before. Um, we spoke to John Marshall, who's the uh, director of a, a, a company called MAP based in, in London, an, an amazing sort of um, globally renowned uh, product innovation company. He said, I think the small revolution is a direct reaction to globalism. Although people enjoy many benefits from globalism, they're looking to regain control at a local level. So the advantage of localism is the ability to tailor products and services to the individual needs. Um, and it's that sort of sense of localism that I wanted to really drive home as a, as a potentially a massive opportunity to every single one of you sitting in this room. And this, I feel, is a nice example. This is um, a skincare fragrance brand, relatively new, um, called Heikels. Um, and I find it really interesting that they call themselves Heikels of Margate. The Of Margate is heavily entrenched. And although some of you might know Margate is the new Shoreditch on sea, it's also um, fascinating that, you know, they have made the decision to totally pinpoint where they're coming from and, and put that at the forefront of their DNA. And I suppose the point I'm trying to make, it doesn't matter where you're based or where you're coming from, as long as your, your sense of provenance is entrenched and, and transparent and clear. Um, 
I wanted to give one more example. A good friend of mine who runs this um, lovely accessories brand, she, um, designs and, and oversees production of, of all of her accessories called Marwood. She uh, fulfilled a lifelong dream of moving out of London. She always wanted to live in rural Devon, and she now does. Uh, but she maintained a studio in London, which she traipsed back and forth to um, on a weekly basis because she felt it had to be part of her brand, that she was connected to London. She's Over the last three years, she's been extracting, 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 to the point that now she, she doesn't have the studio in London anymore, um, which obviously financially is hugely beneficial to her. And she's also rebranded to remove. She was Marwood of London. And I just find that really interesting that it's it you don't need to be connected to a major uh, sort of urban cultural capital to, to have a sense of authentic provenance because people are really interested in alternative areas. Um, I'm going to get quicker because... I've had the five minute warning and I've got too many slides. I'm sorry, it's the danger of having remade the presentation last night. <laughs> um, so the rise of the sharing economy. Um, this was something I think was touched on by Liz Corbin yesterday, talking about this, this shift from, from product to service and system infrastructure. I think this is one of the most tricky challenges and opportunities for, for makers, the notion of things becoming open source and and sort of you know put sharing in perhaps blueprints of designs rather than physical objects itself but it does seem that the sharing economy is providing uh, huge opportunities so you know there's really sort of well bedded in examples like uber netflix um airbnb that obviously have problems with them but also i have many friends that have supplemented their making through letting out a room in their house, for, you know, just as one such example. So the sort of supplementary income stream, I think, is an interesting thing to touch on. Or this lovely example by, uh, I think, one of the speakers later today, Daniel Charney. So sharing is not only sort of making life more affordable or looking at thrift, but it also allows this sort of making of new relationships across phys physical and digital communities. So what it's really about is promoting a we-based culture over a me-based culture, which I think is a, a potential opportunity f for everyone, which Fixperts is about, which sort of aims to connect people that want to, to fix something with those that have the means or the, the knowledge to do so. I'm going to skip over some of these. Um, and then I suppose one of the sort of final opportunities I wanted to touch on was this notion of the, the rise of the aspirational consumer. Um, the, these sort of new attitudes, expectations and demands that are no longer about what you're buying, but what you're buying into. Um, and therefore sort of putting front and centre what you stand for um, being one of the most in, important things. Um, we had an interesting interview with Joe Gabba, who's the co-founder of Airbnb. And obviously he's talking on a huge scale, but one thing that he said really resonated with that notion of, of putting out what you stand for. He said, how can brands empower communities, create tools and get out of the way? What not to do? Impose the ego of your brand on top of them. Instead, communicate what you believe in in order to attract those that believe the same. And there's something really poignant about that. In, and, and what I've, I've tried to cover is that you can connect with those that believe the same with you as you in more ways than you've ever been able to before. So as long as you're putting you know, front and centre at what you, what you believe in, then you can attract those that believe the same. Provide them with tools or a platform to work on top of and have their backs when the tools break and then get out of the way. So again, looking at this sort of uh, more service-based approach as well. We're weary of mass production. I think um, that's quite obvious. That came through yesterday. Um, you know, opportunities for customization, for for repair, for um, we want to feel connected um, to making and to learning. Um, this is an image taken from Makerversity, which is uh, based in London. I'm sure many of you have have heard of it. Uh, providing a space for companies to, to come together and share resources to be more economically viable and share knowledge, but also providing workshops and, and really empowering through learning. Um, and then just picking up on the amazing talk by Catherine yesterday, I think the thing that really struck me uh, at the end of her presentation was that we're still in awe of making. Um, 
I felt terrible because the thing I was sitting there looking, squinting my eyes going, are they renders or did she actually make those? Are those crafted objects? And I think in, in this digital age, that the awe of actually something being physically made has almost never been more important. So, and, and that was the thing that really struck me from, from Catherine's work was that she was communicating this potential future, but it was so powerful because she had handcrafted and gone through the process of, of learning a skill, you know, working with an expert, appreciating expertise to then actually communicate this potential future. I'm going to end by taking you a whistle-stop tour through hopefully just some inspiring projects that are basically sort of summarising this, this potential of, of the future of, of making and materials. So we've taught, I think one of the key things we, we covered yesterday was this notion of distributed collaborative making. So not everything being made in, in one place, but using uh, local resources to distribute production. Um, and designers sort of playing into that. So this is um, a, a collection of furniture which can be is designed specifically so it can be made up anywhere in the world using digital technology. We're seeing that in fashion as well. This is the post couture collection. Um, it's quite exciting because it can be made up by um, effectively an amateur. You don't. It's not stitch based, so you don't know how to. You don't need to, to know how to use a sewing machine. Um, and uh, another such, such example, this is the Meccano collection. Um, there's other examples where designers are sort of looking at perhaps waste streams or widely available uh, materials. So this is um, um, looking at um, a sort of standardised kitchen made out of recycled plastic um, that are sort of fit, fitted together and you can uh, adapt and, and modulely make according to your space requirements. Um, this is a nice example um, using, basically making a comment that, that we are a globalised industrial world, so industrial waste is everywhere, and looking at sort of the most commonly found industrial waste and providing a blueprint that you can make this chair probably from anywhere in the world. And similarly, this designer was uh, looking at the sort of um, industrial scale shel shelving that is widely available. It's sort of like the, uh, the equivalent of a, an IKEA hack in a way, looking at what is globally available and then allowing people to um, make that themselves on a, a local level. The other point I wanted to touch back on was this notion of reconsidering resources. And I think that's what makers are amazing at. And it's not necessarily uh, just looking at uh, sort of emerging technology. So this is a really nice project um, by Thomas Valley in which he is reconsidering um, the pine tree as a resource. So looking at the sap and really having sort of material plays with what um, type of, of material and therefore sort of relevant um, product application can be made. This is a similar approach. Uh, it's the Willow Project by ICAL, uh, a university in Iceland. They basically explored everything to do with the Willow tree, um, but tried to do it in the most unexpected ways. So really take it back to a complete material resource um, and, and think of it sort of really holistically and using every bit. Um, this is an exciting um, uh, series of collections, that's a series of furniture that's using seaweed. Um, so I suppose, and what's nice about this collection is it's, um, it's looking at what's the most ab abundant uh, natural material on the planet that's not currently being utilised. And this is a project by um, one of the students that graduated from the course that um, I found it called Material Futures. And she was working with the byproduct, sorry you can't see her name, Marlene Hussoud. And she's working, it's called From Insects, and it's made from a bee resin, which is the byproduct of beekeeping. And it doesn't harm any of the sort of uh, the, the, um, the bee population, and it doesn't um, affect the honey making. But I think it's a really interesting way of, of reconsidering natural byproducts. And then this is another Material Futures graduate uh, who was working with hair. And um, she found that hair is actually one of the, the most... Um, well, and likely going to, to become one of the most sort of viable sources of waste as the inc population increases. She had some amazing statistics about the volume of hair that we produce, and obviously it keeps growing. <laughs> um, and really interestingly, she found, uh, for example, um, Asian hair could withstand a hell of a lot more weight than Caucasian hair. So there are Im embedded properties in cultural differences as well. 
today's waste is tomorrow's raw material. Um, you know, we are being challenged by, by the environment, but there's ways that we can intuit, uh, in, use ingenuity to respond to that. So, uh, such as this discarded and remastered project where the designers are uh, taking trainer waste and basically sort of remelding it back together. You've probably seen the joining bottles project, which is using a simple way of collecting bottle waste and um, uh, sort of and, and wood waste and reconnecting them using a, a very simple uh, sort of melting technique. This was a, a lovely project that involved a sort of community intervention, the designer working with Tesco and taking their waste and then engaging with local Tesco scores, stores and communities and en encouraging people to sort of have a little go at fashion designing as they do their shopping. Um, this is one of my favourite projects, Frank and Toy Mobile. As a, um, a recent parent, I, I, I find it scary how sort of the needs of a child evolve so quickly and toys become redundant. Um, this is a workshop set up where kids are invited to bring their sort of, you know, toys that they don't want to play with anymore and make them into something completely different. Um, these sort of Frank and Toys. I promise I'm nearly there. <laughs> um, Grow your own. I think Maurizio touched on this yesterday and um, the idea that actually I believe that materiality is, is the building blocks of, of design and making and if we can reconsider you know, how we're using materials and where we're sourcing them from, um, we can act a, a lot more sustainably. Um, and perhaps fabricating in your own home and growing your own material is not too far a future. So this is grow juice, um, which is effectively uh, a, 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 a home factory that proposes that you will be able to grow your own material. So this is a bacterial cellulose. Um, it's a sort of fermentation from like a, a green tea, which many of designers have been playing with. Um, this was a student from Material Futures uh, three years ago who created a biological 3D printer effectively. So rather than laying down material as you do with a 3D printer, the idea that you feed it in specific areas to grow in specific ways or for a specific period of time and you can change the properties of material. Again, something that Maurizio was talking about yesterday. So if you feed your material for nine days, you can make a paper or, or more like a leather if you feed it for 15 days. And, and this type of, of biological material is being investigated on a huge scale. Uh, companies like Modern Meadow that are really heavily invested in, in making um, the, a synthetic leather. And then I just wanted to end with one further future um, suggestion that we're seeing in... Uh, I suppose, in makers and, and, and material designers. Uh, the Anthropocene was mentioned quite a lot yesterday, so this notion that we are now starting to witness the impacts of, of man's uh, or, or human's activities on the earth on an industrial level. So the materials that we're using and the way we've been processing them are now starting to impact um, our ecology and, uh, and uh, soon our, geolog uh, our geology. Um, this is a nice example, Fordite, you might have seen, or it's, or it's also known as Detroit Agate. Um, it's uh, basically made from the, uh, a sort of byproduct from the car industry, so these layers of paint that are uh, sort of scraped off the production line and then being polished and made into these sort of precious stones. I suppose what I wanted to end with was the, the suggestion that perhaps we need to reconsider our, um, our notion of, of natural and, and unnatural and, and really sort of actually consider what a, a raw material is. Um, this is plastic conglomerate um, and this was actually sourced um, in a place, Camilo Beach in Hawaii, and they found um, a, a mix of molten uh, plastic debris and beach sediment, uh, including sand, wood, coral, and plastic had already started to form. So this is naturally forming material of the Anthropocene, if you like. Um, but we also have many designers that seem to be really interested in this notion of one student was calling it geomimicry, mimicking geological processes to, to make effectively future materials um, such as this or this is the crafting of the Anthropocene by Yesenia and this is bone marble and she's basically proposing that because of foot and mouth uh, disease in a particular area in Wales where many many bones of carcasses were, were buried at some point in a far future you are going to be able to dig up a, a bone marble. So 
this is hypothesis, but I think it's a really interesting um, proposition to, to really start to reconsider the type of materials that we're working with. Um, sorry, I spoke over. Everybody did. I'm really sorry. <laughs> Um, thank you very much. I'm around later if, if anyone has any questions or um, do feel free to drop me an email. Thank you.